Uh, so uh, may we now invite our third speaker, uh, Mr. Zhang Menwai Tong from Singapore. Thank you so much. I just begin. Okay, I, I begin. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, hi. Good morning. Um, the title of my presentation is called Zen My Filmmaking. It is a a pedagogical approach to make the practice of filmmaking more mindful and in the present. My name is Zhang Moin Tong. Um, I'm a independent researcher. I'm from Singapore. Uh, I am myself a film and media educator. I'm also an independent film producer, filmmaker with films that have traveled to uh, international film festivals and won awards. But what is Zen? Zen is one of the hardest things to define, isn't it? Because there are so many schools of thoughts uh, within Zen uh, by so many Zen masters with different ways of explaining it to people with different levels of understanding. I like this a definition by uh, Mr. Richard Collins in his book called No Fear Zen, that Zen is about living non-dualistically in the here and the now. Non-dualistically meaning that there is no other, there is no two, that the, the other, the outside and the inside is also one. Uh, Zen can be, uh, can, his origins can be traced back to India uh, when the sage Bodhidharma, known as Tamo, came to China and promoted a, a school of thought. So this school of thought has been passed down over a few patriarchs, and one, uh, the famous one being the sixth patriarch, Hui Neng, and then after that, it slowly exported into Vietnam, Japan, and Korea to become the version of Zen, uh, which originated from Chan, that we, orig uh, that we know today. Um, but what is Zen? It is about emphasizing the value of uh, intuition and meditation over the ritualistic worship and the study of scriptures. Uh, Dr. T.T. Suzuki described Zen as non-dogmatic, non-spiritual, non-conceptual. So I like this really this quote from Alan Watts, who describes Zen as a way of liberation, concerned not with discovering what is good or bad or advantageous, but what is. So it is not uncommon to hear of art inspired by Zen practice. We see that in calligraphy, Chinese painting, archery, architecture, Kung Fu, maybe even photography. But how are we going to bring Zen, which is a very practiced, personal, spiritual art form, into something so complex like filmmaking? What is cinema? Cinema, we know that it's more than just a technological breakthrough. We know that cinema is not just 25 frames per second. That when we capture the movie, the, the, the picture, 25 frames per second, and create a moving image, we manage to capture something called humanity. We manage to capture emotions, meanings, ideas. And it, cinema becomes an expression of consciousness. And that's what we understand of cinema, an expression of ideas, beliefs, the intangible fears, memories, aspirations. It fits into the Buddhist concept of how things are wu tang, which is non-permanent, how the moving image allows us to see things as they are and then later things that are more than what it is and they are at any present moment. Then again, filmmaking is complex. Filmmaking involves the complex interplay of various artistic disciplines, script writing, casting, performance. It is so logistical. Production design, color, lighting, movement, all of these are, are, are epic uh, disciplines on their own, but none of these disciplines individually by themselves is filmmaking. Filmmaking is more than the sum of all these parts. All right. And it's and I noticed that filmmaking is always very conditional. Filmmaking involves funding, finance, sponsorship, location availability, permissions, distributions. It's always uh dependent on somebody to allow filmmaking to exist. So how uh, and it's always in service of some kind of outcome that exists never in the present and always in the future. When you're shooting, when you're editing, you're always doing it for the future. I realized that filmmaking can be very, very sacrificial. This is a picture of me in 2012 on the set of a film that I made. Uh, it's called Fairyville. Today, Fairyville is a, a film on Netflix in Southeast Asia. But back then in 2012, this picture of me is a picture of a very, very uncertain person and a person who is very fearful working on a film that he knows is going to fail. Um, so film involves, I'm not the only one here that talks about filmmaking, how filmmaking can give you everything, but at the same time, take everything away from you. This is a quote by the director of Birdman. His name is Alejandro Inaritu. 
And James Cameron himself, the director of Titanic, talks about how the director's job is really not just to make that film, but to make the film happen. You have to cajole, you have to flatter, you have to tell people what needs to be done, and you must bring a passion into these things. It makes me realize that, uh, I just want to add one more quote from Tarkovsky here, right? that the artist is always a servant, always perpetually trying to pay for a gift that has been given to him by a miracle, but he has to put in that sacrifice. So it makes me realize something very difficult, that how the artist is always entangled, always trapped. As a teacher, as a media educator, I have a problem. I noticed that some of my smartest and best filmmaking students graduated not knowing, not wanting to make another film again. All right? They tell me things like, I don't know where this is going. They think sometimes it's going nowhere. I'm always dependent on something that's outside me. It's dependent on weather permissions, dependent on heaven. So much effort just to start. It's just the funding. It's also time. And everybody feels that they are, they are at the mercy of things outside their control. So it makes me question, is filmmaking an artistic practice? Often, I notice that the hustle takes over the art of filmmaking and storytelling. And as a filmmaker, the attitude of practicing for its own sake is something that I envy in other art forms like dance, like painting, like music. When a dancer is dancing, they are one with the art. When a musician is holding a guitar and playing, he is at this moment one with his art. The filmmaker is always never in the present. As a person who believes so much in passion and greed in the making of all the films that I made before, I realized that greed, passion, and sacrifice is not sustainable and they cannot be the only way to make films. So there's my research question, is that how can filmmaking be less conditional, less dependent, and free from all this entanglement? Can filmmaking be more zen? Can it be more present, less fatigued, and be made in the here and the now? To do this, I observe not, I do not just want to read books from philosophers, theories, and scholars. I also explore how Zen is applied in neurology, in psychotherapy, by psychologists, by meditation teachers. And I read the books of Thich Nhat Hanh, who is also a peace activist. So it's not just Zen as a form of Buddhism or sitting or meditating, but of something that can be engaged, and in my case, engaged into the arts. I extracted three key concepts from Zen Buddhism and their minimalism, non-attachment, and being in the here and the now. In order to bring them into the film, I also studied existing minimalist film movements, like the Dogma 95 film movement that started in, uh, in, in Denmark, uh, the no-wave cinema uh, of, of uh, New York that, that embraces the punk DIY ethic, uh, using ultra-low budget to make really, really subversive films. And then the Romanian new wave that uh, uses minimalistic, naturalistic tactics, but more of to create films that is a reaction against propaganda so that they don't use state funding. Um, but I wanted something of our own, something Asian, uh, inspired by Asian philosophy, not inspired by, in our case, revolution, punk rock, or transgressiveness. So minimalism, non-attachment, being the here and the now, can these principles in Zen philosophy help filmmaking to go back to its essence? Can Zen philosophy change the filmmaking practice? And if so, how? Can a filmmaker still make a film embracing Zen principles? So I came up with a methodology. I wanted to use these principles and I converted them into a methodology in which films can be made. So how do I work with non-attachment? It's for the filmmaker to have a plan, but not be fixated by it. The end product is allowed to look very different from what is planned. How do we be in the here and the now is to encourage the filmmaker to use conditions to work with the as is, the what we have, the dustness and the suchness of things that is in the now. What about minimalism? It's about minimizing, yes, of course, but to minimize it further, I brought a certain kind of mortality to the duration of filmmaking by having a four-hour shoot, a four-hour edit, and to only shoot with whatever you have. So how would a Zen Mai film look like? Is it still a film? There is a fear in me now as this researcher because I'm still a filmmaker. And will this filmmaking change filmmaking process to become something so minimalistic that it's almost like abstract and just arty? All right. And can this be brought into film education? So the experiment was done. In the first experiment, uh, the experiment, I had two cycles of experiment. I work with different filmmakers with different levels of experience. I conducted few observations, interviews. I did a pre-shoot and a post-shoot and a post-edit interview. 
And I encourage filmmakers to keep a journal so I could document insecurities, anxieties, confessions, if they try to cheat out of, out of their way and what, what kind of cheat codes do they use and ways to get around the limitations. Uh, to facilitate the making of this, I created a manifesto inspired by Dogma 95, but I created a Zen My Manifesto. They dictate the rules and regulations, the limitations that is meant to free the filmmaker from the entitlements. Why did I create a manifesto? I'm not there to teach them about Zen. I'm there to use Zen film to, to inspire filmmaking. And I wanted Zen My Filmmaking to still respect cinema and not take away from cinema what cinema can do. So uh, not to make cinema more Zen, but to use Zen to help cinema. So uh, uh, these are some of the, the lines in the manifesto. You can take a look. I'm a filmmaker. I'm aware this is an experiment. I'm aware of my being as part of the whole. Um, I'm present in my body. I'll be active as well as passive. I'm in control. I'm also not in control. And that my feelings about control is not important. I'm aware that my experiment is four hours. I'll use my skills, my intuition. I'll engage my beginner's mind. I will adhere to time, but I will not be worried by it. I will accept time as a assurance, a certain a certainty that energy is finite. I accept the definity of everything. I accept change. I minimize anxiety. And this is one of the most important slides. I will make the film with the vision and the intention. I cannot just let it go. Uh, when I'm editing, uh, things may change. I, I, I practice acceptance. Uh, I will not cling. I will create a film that is whole. This is important. There is not a scene, not a footage. It cannot be random. It has to be its own thing. And it should stand by itself, not needing of a, a director's statement or an accompanying document to explain to people what my film is about. The film itself must be whole and has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So the first cycle of experiment I worked with us a former student who is now a, a junior producer uh, made, made a film and he chose to make a film that actually has a story around it. It's about two women who are, who wants to commit suicide. They meet on the top of the roof and they became friends and it became a story about courage to live or as well as courage to die. That even in death, you need courage. But the first cycle of my experiment revealed to me enough that Zen my filmmaking, the rules, is able to, in some way, reduce fatigue, free the filmmaker from conditions and entanglements because he doesn't need to work with funds. He could work with films in a little bit more in the here and the now. But it made me want a second cycle where I asked the question, what kind of films can come out of the Zen mind? And how is it different from the other minimalist film movements like Dogma, like Romanian New Wave? So came Cycle 2. In Cycle 2, I worked with different people. Cycle 2, this is a, a student that just graduated. He wanted, he was... Um, he was always assisting people in other people's films, but never made a film of his own. He's terrified about graduation. He's uh, in Singapore, we have national service. He's, he's finishing national service and about to go to the real world. So he, he said he wanted to be part of the experiment and he decided to make a film about his own anxieties about graduating and going out to the world. He's made a film about lethargy. And this, I did a little bit of a plot diagram to measure if there's emotional changes to see if there is a story arc. And there is a very, very gentle story up in Shafiq's film. So um, in, uh, I also work with Zach. Zach is my, another candidate. And Zach decided to make a film about unlikely friendship of two people meeting the bench. And it became a story about who is telling the truth, uh, who is lying, uh, faking personalities. And at the end, a team that is about is the truth even important? So I did a plot diagram and there are many, many uh, uh, complicated uh, emotional changes in this film. And the film is complete with the beginning, a middle and an end. The third, the, the third candidate I work with is the most interesting. His name is Matt. And unlike the other two filmmakers, he is not a filmmaker. He's a film critic. He's never made a film before. He's a lover of cinema and he wanted to be part of the Zenma experiment. I wanted to figure out if a person who has no experience can be involved and be part of this. And this is what happened. He failed. <laughs> he wanted to work without a script. He wanted to uh, not tell the actor what he's going to shoot. And, and it... And I, they have enough data to show that Zen Mai cannot just be letting go or allowing the person or allowing things to happen. So technically, uh, this, this is a, a project that failed. And I say, thank you for your contributions. It's a wrap. But he says, no, uh, can I do it again? Give me another four hours. I want to try it again. And in the second version of it, 
he managed a filmmaker who has no prior experience to making a film, managed to complete a film with a three-act structure, a beginning, a middle, and an end, a very, very complex story arc that in, his, in this little story is about an actor who is really frustrated with the director who asked him to be Zen and to be in the here and now. So he actually made a film that went meta and kind of used a film to, to, to scold himself about how he cannot even be present and, and get something done right. So these are the findings that I discovered uh, from the two cycles of the experiment. Uh, despite imposed limitations, Zen, my filmmaking, which, which I impose rules for, it's actually found to be more liberating rather than lim limiting. Uh, Darshan describes, because I don't have to explain myself, I can just do, I can just express myself through certain decisions that I may not have explanations for. The parameters help me to focus on what's important and I don't have to overthink. So you allow the co control of things. So this is the traditional relationship between the filmmaker and the film. It's supposed to be pure. It's supposed to be direct. The filmmaker transfers his consciousness into a medium called the film. However, this is not in the real world. In the real world, obstacles will always come in. The, the gatekeepers, the environment, the people, the obstacles will always come in and the obstacles always come in to be part of the film. So the fatigue is not in the director's relationship with control, but uh, the, the fatigue is actually not in the making of the film, but it's in the director's relationship with the control, trying to control and contain the, the obstacles. So by changing the relationship of control, I change it to that of co-control. So I realized that the filmmaker in working in under Zen Maya rules is open to work with modes of serendipity. They use the background so much. They use things that are in the shot because they can't produce, they can't set direct. They are, they are, they are using the environment as part of the background story. It reminds me a lot of Chinese paintings, all right? Uh, Chinese and Japanese paintings, where the background, the negative space, is part of the art. So instead of painting the river, the sea, the, the water, I, leave, I let the emptiness of the paper become that bright little reflection of the water. It is so different for, compared to the Western painting where the subject fills up the can canvas in an, a Chinese painting or a Japanese painting. The poet drinking by the moonlight by this by, by Song Dynasty painter, Ma Yuan. Look at the, how small the painter, the, the, the figure is. And notice that in the films, of the Zen Mai films, they, they try to go wider so that their subjects are a little bit smaller, using the environment in the background to be part of the story. I also noticed that a lot of use of accidents uh, in the here and the now. All right. For example, in this image of the curtain coming down, the, person, the curtain fell just before the shoot and uh, Mat Matthias decided to just work with the broken curtain. It doesn't make sense. Uh, in, on a real film set, uh, it says this, this thing needs to be explained, but he didn't want to explain it. The curtain was, the person crawled under the curtain, came to the shoot. And I realized that instead of being hindered by the environment, they started to use and co-create with accidents. It reminds me of a Japanese concept of wabi-sabi in Kintsugi, where they use a broken cup and they try to put gold little things in the, on the cracks. I noticed that there's a sense of wholeness and completeness in spite of all these accidents. All films eventually created films that are whole with complete story arcs, not random, abstract, poetic pieces that you could already imagine when I say Zen my films. And they appear to be deep with personal meaning or films in search of some kind of meaning. Be maybe because of the liberation that I do not need to explain, they are a little bit more confident in the expression of the abstract, willing to enter into an existential, philosophical conversations with the self using the medium of film. So I realized that um, when the filmmaker is less entangled, he's able to realize some kind of freedom and agency to use his practice, the film practice, as a means of actualization. Traditionally, we use the film as a medium to express, but in this case, I noticed that the film is expressing back to the filmmaker. So, there are many definitions for Zen. Many talk about how it is the sitting, the in-breath, the out-breath, the meditation, that Zen is just sitting. But really, Zen is about coming back to the center. The sitting is meant to help you come back to the center. The breathing, the stillness is all meant to help you come back to the center. What is the center of filmmaking? The center of filmmaking is the act of doing. The act of doing what? The act of telling a story with a moving image. So perhaps with Zen my filmmaking, this experiment that became some kind of a pedagogy, methodology, that's also becoming a movement when the films are traveling in the festivals now, 
filmmaking is able to come back more the center without the excesses, without the entanglements. Uh, and with that, I conclude my presentation. I have a QR code here where you can access the films as well as the manifesto, which I uploaded into this URL. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, so uh, may we now invite our last uh, uh, 